Oki from Muskogee to Karen Williams, who was from Muskogee, Oklahoma. And she was the big game queen for UCLA. Um, and it was worth the effort. And of course, he came through with flying colors. And the only reason he got there was because I was talking to somebody else and he beat me to her. He was instantly surrounded by eight guys. And you won't believe this, Mark's a great salesman. And uh, he won her over, made us all jealous. Well, anyway, again, uh, thanks very much for the introduction. As Mark mentioned, I'm a professor of OBGYN actually at uh, Oakland University, Will William Beaumont uh, School of Medicine. It's in uh, Oakland County here in southeastern uh, Michigan. I am vice chair of OBGYN at Beaumont Royal Oak Hospital, which is, I'm told, third largest hospital in the country. We're the largest hospital in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we're the largest health system. Uh, Beaumont Royal Oak is the flagship hospital of the Nate Hospital System. Uh, and to no surprise, we're also taking care of more COVID patients in the state of Michigan than anyone else. And uh, until recently, we're number three in the country. Um, sadly, um, Chicago's pass is up, but actually before that, Massachusetts just blew everybody away. So we're an 1,100-bed hospital uh, at Royal Oak. Uh, the overall system, I believe, is about 3,400 beds. So it's a pretty big place. Um, so why is it OBGYN giving this talk? Well, actually, OBGYNs are the original and still best experts in infectious disease. The whole germ theory uh, was first proposed in the 1840s by Austro-Hungarian OBGYN Ignat Simmelweis, and that in itself is a whole lecture. But in OBGYN, um, we are infectious disease experts. And in the influenza season each year, the people at highest risk are actually pregnant women, uh, followed by elderly people with COPD. But pregnant women have reduced pulmonary function, reduced lung function, so they're extremely uh, susceptible to disease and death. So there's a great um, article, uh, March 27th, in the uh, Wall Street Journal, if you read it and you go back. It's talking about the making of an epidemic, and it's a great review. Um, but it really goes back to um, the mid-14th century in Italy, which was overwhelmed by the bubonic plague, and they figured the only way they could really treat the disease was to isolate sailors and ships for 40 days. Italian and, or if, <laughs> for 40 days, in Italian, it's quarenta, so that's where the word quarantine comes from. And that continued on uh, in the mid-1600s, 1660, London was hit with the bubonic plague. And uh, so many people died, it would be equivalent to 2 million Londoners dying today. And again, the only way to treat it was with quarantine. In the, the last 100 years, actually the greatest pandemic occurred before this one. And that was the 1918 through 1919 Great Flu Epidemic, you know, often referred to as Spanish flu, which was actually slanderous uh, because the United States had uh, beaten Spain and it was still looking down upon them after the Spanish-American War. But it really should be called the swine flu, or as I call it, the Kansas flu, because actually it started in Kansas, swept across the world, killed somewhere between you know, 50 and 100 million people. We don't know how many people were killed. But it was a H1N1 flu, just like we had in 2009, only we had no treatment for it. Started in birds, went to pigs. Kansas is pig country. All the pigs were dying. They incinerated the pigs right next to the Army depots, specifically Fort Riley in Junction City, Kansas, where they had about 50,000 young kids doing uh, jumping jacks and marching in the midst of this plume of swine virus. And they carried it to Chicago, New York, La Havre, France, to the battlefields of the First World War. From there, it swept around the world, and it came back. It came back in 1919. And I'm talking to a bunch of people in California. So let me tell you what happened in that second wave in January in the first five days. They had 1,800 cases and 105 deaths in just five days. And it got worse and worse. Uh, briefly, Second World War happened because of the swine flu of 1918 and 1919. Woodrow Wilson was the United States president. And his job was to moderate the peace settlement between England, France, Germany, uh, the Germans uh, had started the war. The Brits and French wanted blood in return, and Woodrow Wilson felt that would not result in a lasting peace, so he was there to moderate. But there was a recurrence, actually a third wave that hit Paris at that time in April of 1919. He got sick. He was bedridden, so he couldn't lead the conference. 
The British and French got what they wanted. The Germans were screwed. The Germans were pissed. It allowed Adolf Hitler to rise to power. And the Second World War resulted. So why did the Second World War result? Because the quarantine wasn't prolonged enough. It wasn't effective. And it caused the Second World War. And how many more millions of people died there? We're still counting those deaths. So you all know this current COVID-19 epidemic has actually been caused by the uh, SARS the systemic anti-inflammatory response virus 2, SARS-CoV-2. You hear COVID. COVID means um, essentially refers to this virus from 2019. It's a little, but this came from a bat. All these viruses come from animals. Uh, the flu vaccines that we get each year are used to treat viruses that come from predominantly Asian birds. It affects the Asian population, comes across the Pacific Ocean, and we're ready for it most years. Uh, sometimes these viruses come from African animals. HIV, Ebola, Zika, they all came from African animals. So if we really want to get a handle on the future, we need to do a better job studying the infectious diseases of animals, but we're not there yet. Uh, each year, the CDC does go to Asia and prepares for the coming flu. It's different each year, which is why you have to get a flu vaccine each year. The problem is the vaccines don't last forever. You know, they last about 18 months and they wear off. It's very hard to vaccinate against many viruses. But uh, this year, we didn't expect to have uh, bats join the uh, meat market and get us all sick. So what happened was this, uh, you know, Wuhan is a city of 11 million people. And during the Lunar New Year migration, which is their greatest holiday of the year, the city swells by an additional 5 million people. Just at its baseline, 11 million people, that's bigger than New York City. And living in the United States, I'm a pretty intelligent, well-read guy. I'd never heard of Wuhan, China. So it swelled about 16 million people. The infection started. The 5 million people left Wuhan and returned to their homes around Asia, the United States, Italy, Spain, everywhere. 5 million people around the world returned home. Then they locked down the borders. It was a little, too little, too late. So... By, we think probably the first infection actually occurred mid-November, about November 17th. The Chinese government credits the official first case to be December 1st. But by January 30th, the World Health Organization realized we got a hell of a problem on our hands, and they declared a public health an emergency of international concern. That's like DEFCON 4. Only by March 11th, we hit DEFCON 5, and the WHO declared it a pandemic. That means it's the whole world. It's not just an endemic in one area, it's a pandemic. So um, you, you've all heard the number. <laughs> of course, the numbers change every day. Uh, the virus goes everywhere. Unfortunately, once you get exposed, you're usually not symptomatic for three to five days. One person can readily infect 40 people in no time at all. The sad thing, even those people who become infected, at least one in four are completely symptom free. So you see these idiots on spring break down in Fort Lauderdale, I feel fine. Yeah, they go home, they infect their mother and their grandmother, then we have a problem. It turns out there's a much higher rate of asymptomatic infection in children. So you gotta keep your children away from grandma and grandpa, it's more likely to kill them. And we thought initially that when people are asymptomatic, they'll incubate the virus for just one to 12 days. So it made sense. Okay, so if you've been exposed, quarantine yourself for two weeks, not the Italian 40 days, and everything's gonna be fine. Now, what do you know? The Italians were right, because what we're finding through prolonged testing is that people are actually harboring the virus, shedding the virus, continuing to affect people far more than just 14 days commonly. If you do get sick, we're telling you about 86% of people have mild disease, you know, it makes you feel like shit. You have a lot of muscle aches, headache, you are incredibly tired. You can have, you know, cough, shortness of breath. You can have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Many people, the only symptoms are loss of the sense of smell and the loss of sense of taste. That's because the virus, when you first inhale it, it goes up into your nose, deep into your head, and that's where the nerves for the senses of taste and smell live. And as those cells become inflamed and swollen, the nerves get infected. Suddenly you can't smell, you can't taste. And if that's as sick as you get, that's great. But as you inhale these viral particles even deeper into your chest, then you're in trouble. Because that's where you get the real pneumonia, the fever, the chills, the sweats, I can't breathe. At that point, you're usually about uh, seven to 10 days since you were first exposed. 
and that's severe disease, and that's about 9% of people, if you don't get any better, you come to my hospital, we're going to stick a tube down your throat because you just can't breathe on your own anymore. It's about 5% of people. So we call critical disease. And if that happens to you, you've only got about a 50% chance of surviving and going home. The older you are, the more comorbidities, the more medical problems you have, less likely you are to ever see your house again. And you're going to die alone because we can't let family members come in and stay because they just bring the disease or they get infected from being in the hospital. So how do we treat this? Isolation. Second way we treat it, isolation. Third way we treat it, isolation. Then we go into social distancing and wash your damn hands for at least 20 seconds. And 20 seconds is a heck of a long time. Uh, we may have a vaccine for healthcare professionals only um, by fall or late fall, but we don't even know if it's gonna be effective. If we have a vaccine, it's gonna be another year to 18 months. And that's just too little too late. We have a lot of issues with the vaccine. Number one, even if it does work, it only lasts for a year, a year and a half. And we don't smother this virus. It's just going to continue to linger in the community and come right back. It's like not putting your campfire out. If you only pour a little water on it, the cinder will warm up, the wind's going to come and blow, and it's going to be right back. Everybody's out of work. Everybody's lost their uh, insurance coverage. And if anybody had money saved, it's all gone. So who's going to pay? for this vaccine. And there's plenty of people out there who are still crazy enough to uh, not believe that vaccination is a good idea. Marin County and Berkeley's full of these people. You hear a lot about the miracle drugs like Plaquenil. It's not a miracle drug. It's more likely to kill you because it can adversely affect your heart and give you a heart attack. Azithromycin doesn't prevent the, prevent the uh, progression of the disease, but if you get really sick, and get not just a viral pneumonia, but your body is so weak, secondary bacterial infection attacks you, then the azithromycin can work against the bacteria. But other than that, no, there's no magic bullet. Um, remdesivir, which is made by Gilead in Redwood City, I mean, they are just heroes to me because they have done so much in HIV. Uh, remdesivir was first designed to treat Ebola, and it didn't work. Uh, they brought it back out and actually the first study was just finished they had 1065 patients and what they found if you gave the really sick people those five percent of affected people who have critical disease they're in the uh, hospital and we've got them intubated you can reduce the length of time that it takes to get them home from 15 days with nothing to 11 days with remdesivir so you can save four days if you do nothing if you take the placebo you know, you can reduce the death rate to about 15% with good health care, but remdesivir only drops it down to about 15%. So, yeah, there's a slight improvement chances of dying or not, but it's not a miracle drug. I mean, it, it helps a little bit, and that's the best we can say about it. Sure, it's better than nothing, but it's expensive, and uh, there's some side effects to go with it. So, Michigan, let me talk about that for a second. First case we had was delayed. We didn't get it for a long time. Hit California in January. And I was still getting all my emails from UCSF through the Sutter system, so I'd been ready. But we didn't get a case until March 11th. We, we now believe through DNA studies that unlike the usual seasonal flu where it comes from Asia, goes across the Pacific, hits the West Coast, and then heads the East Coast, no, because of the mass migration after the lunar holiday, Probably people from Wuhan went to Italy and then Spain. And we got sick here in Michigan, New York, and New Jersey as the disease went from Europe back to the United States across the Atlantic. So the governor was pretty quick in closing down the schools, colleges, uh, isolation order. Finally went in after about 11 days. I would have done it faster, but compared to everybody else, he's a great job. Um, currently, as of yesterday, We've, uh, here in Michigan, we've had over 40,000 cases and over 3,000 deaths. Uh, in our Beaumont system, we've had uh, over 700 deaths. We were diagnosing, at the peak, over 1,200 people per day. Uh, now we're down to about 600 people per day. So yeah, sure, we've come down a lot. You graph out the curve, wow, you know, we really skyrocketed off. We had this exponential growth. It uh, looked like a mountain for a while, we're coming back down, but we are still diagnosing 600 people a day. And those are sick people, sick people sick enough to come and you know, require that we test them. 
So we know that four to five, maybe 10 times that many people are still getting infected each day, but they're not having symptoms. So one thing we do know is uh, why is it so much worse in New York, New Jersey, Detroit, Chicago, New Orleans? That's because historically disease always picks on the poorest people and has the worst impact. They have lousy nutrition. They live in much more crowded conditions. You tell people to go home and isolate. You can't isolate when you have multiple generations living under one roof. When you're poor, you also have more comorbidities. You have more medical problems. You see, especially, I'm not in California anymore. Uh, here in the Midwest and the East Coast, you see a lot more obesity. You see a lot more high blood pressure, a lot more diabetes, a lot more asthma, and a lot more smoking. So again, the more of these problems you have, the older you are, the more likely you're going to die. So what we're seeing is a huge impact, not just on our population, but on our health care system. Uh, at Beaumont, we've got 38,000 employees, and 4% went out sick. Uh, we've had, uh, fortunately, no health care deaths in our system, but in our immediate area, we've lost an ER nurse, a maxillofacial surgeon, a surgical tech. Overall, what we're seeing in data from New York is showing that healthcare workers are much more likely to get sick than the general population. Well, no shit, Sherlock. Why is that? Because, you know, when you're taking care of sick people, you're more likely to get sick. So in many communities, we're seeing up to 11% of all healthcare professionals get sick. I've uh, had a, several residents, a midwife, and several, uh, about seven nurses go out out of 174 nurses that report to me. Um, fortunately, they've all survived, but uh, a couple of them are close to my age, and I was very concerned about them. They're still, you know, they're back at work, but, you know, they're not 100%. Um, moving on. So, longer impact. And so, that's really the history of the disease. That's the medical part. But what we're seeing financially is also huge. Um, to give you an idea, every hospital operates on a razor thin margin of profit. Uh, we're a very large, successful. Uh, health system, we run on a 3% margin. Mayo Clinic, uh, I, I always bad mouth every chance I get because everybody thinks Mayo Clinic is so great. Yes, they are great at public relations. And I always tell the specialty they have is the wallet biopsy because they love to do these executive physicals and bring people in, order every test imaginable, which is very good for the profit margin. They're not necessarily providing better care, they're just providing more expensive care. But here it is, the, the most financially successful health system in the country has a 5% profit margin. There aren't too many other industries that can survive with such a poor return on their investment. And you, know, you can only imagine about the investment, the amount of money that gets processed through a hospital on any given day. When we um, do make money, we make money off our commercial insurance paper patients, patients of Blue Cross, Blue Shield, when you have patients with Medicaid, in California, it's Medi-Cal. California is the worst place to take care of Medicaid, uh, Medi-Cal patients because in California, we have the largest population of any state in the country. We have the largest Medi-Cal, Medicaid population in the United States, and we have the worst reimbursement in California. Uh, in California, Medi-Cal pays for about 60% of the cost of care, which means the hospital and the doctors eat 40% of that cost and have to make it up by taking care of other patients. Who are the other patients we take care of? Medicare. Well, federal government's not stupid. You know, they pretty much, if they set a lot of rules, and if you play by their rules and provide good care and get the patient out of the hospital as fast as you can, on a good day, you break even. So how do you survive? How do you keep the doors open, the lights turned on? How do you pay your staff? You make your money on your commercial patients, and so many of those patients, they're young, healthy employee, they're coming in for elective surgeries, a little bit on the older side, they're getting hip and knee replacements, but that's where we make our money. The obstetrical population, young, healthy women are coming in, having babies, and we collect money for that, and that supports our operation. Well, across the country, that financial plan has been turned upside down because we canceled all elective surgery. The patients who come to the hospitals with commercial insurance are at home. Instead, we are taking care of Medicaid and Medicare patients. In the best day, you either lose 30 to 40% or you break even. And that's on average. 
what we're doing now, for instance, my hospital, it's an 1100 bed hospital. We're keeping about 800 beds going. Um, we were up to 400 patients a day just with COVID. I have 13 units dedicated just to taking care of COVID patients, including one that I personally oversee for patients. So when you have a patient who is requiring all these medications, all this attention, ventilation care, respiratory therapists, you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a day on a given patient. So the financial drain has been unbelievable. In the first three weeks of April, uh, our hospital system lost over $450 million. Before you know it, we're talking about serious money. But that situation is not unique to BOMA. And again, we're looked upon as an affluent healthcare system. If you go down the road, not far from where I live, to Sinai Grace Hospital in Northwest Detroit, it's in the poorest part of town. All their patients have either Medicaid or Medicare. I don't know how they've been able to stay open before, but they are living on borrowed time. Um, we've responded to it in different ways. You guys, I, I still read SanFranciscoGate.com, so I know what's going on in California. Stanford has given people, the physicians, pay cut. Mayo Clinic, which employs 70,000 people, put 35,000 people on furlough or reduced salary. At my hospital, of again, 28,000 uh, employees, um, they put, I think, 15% on furlough or they fired them outright. That's got a 20% pay cut. John Hopkins is doing the same thing. The hospitals in New York, I don't know how they're going to meet their bills. Um, it's a real problem. And unfortunately, as you know, most of the People aren't willing to lend as money. Uh, federal governments, you know, build out the auto industry here in Detroit. They build out the banks and they're bailing out the airlines. They bailing out uh, Ruth Chris restaurant chain. Um, haven't been very effective in bailing out small business. And you have to remember, most physicians who are self-employed or small businessmen, they're not work. They're not able to see patients. Um, at the hospital, I'm concerned how much longer we can keep the lights on. And um, keep things going. I've lost uh, both my administrative assistants, my administrative fellows. Um, they're all at home. Um, initially, it was going to be a 60-day furlough. Uh, I was whispered, it was whispered in my ear today that most of those people aren't coming back. Uh, God bless administration. They've been able to maintain health care coverage for these people. But again, that's not going to be able to, even though we're self-insured, I won't be able to keep that up long. Um, you look at New York, New Jersey, uh, Chicago, New Orleans, you know, it's the exact same thing. Um, at Beaumont, again, I mentioned before, we're in eight hospital system. We shut one of our hospitals down, Beaumont Wayne, which is in Wayne County next to Detroit. Uh, we're hoping to open it up again in two weeks if we can. Um, physically, we can put beds back in, turn the lights back on, bring the doctors back, and hopefully get the patients back, but we don't know if we'll be able to cover the overhead to pay the people who do show up to work. So um, it's going to be a, a challenging time. The other thing that we worry about at the hospital is, yeah, right now we're broke. We've just about wiped out all, everything we had in the bank. But the reality is this is probably going to be just like the Kansas flu, the swine flu, the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919. Because people just are people. You know, they're frustrated. They're scared to death. They're broke. They want to get back to normal. And the problem is that's just going to cause the disease to come back. And it's always worse in the uh, late fall and early winter. So, you know, we're looking at quarter three, quarter four. We're really expecting to see a resurgence, which is both going to be a financial hit to us for a loss of income, and our expenses are going to go up again. So um, right now I'm glad I'm a doctor, not a hospital administrator. Um, Mark has been telling me about this product, and the software you sell, and oh, it's so impressive, especially at this campus that I work in, uh, again, 1100 bed hospital, absolutely huge. To have a program like this, you know, for engineering and everything else, but unfortunately, we laid off or furloughed a number of our engineers, our housekeepers were barely keeping on. Fortunately, they barely make minimum wage, and they're the people who are, who are my greatest heroes. They have the toughest job, the most dangerous job, is cleaning up the mess that we create. Um, so that said, um, my concern is, you know, the 
everything that the hospital purchases is being examined, being evaluated, you know, from paper for the copy machine, every single thing. There's uh, no money. My, my good friend is uh, the head recruiter for this huge system. I'm sitting in her uh, kitchen right now. And she has just told me, um, no, we're going to be probably eliminating the people that were furloughed, but we have a huge number of physicians who are graduating from training programs or have been recruited from other locations to come to the Beaumont hospitals to provide their special services. And they're being told, you know, we, we, we did have you sign a letter of intent and you signed a contract, but we can't have you come because we don't have the money to pay you to start. Um, so that's really going to impact the kind of care that we can provide to our patients. Uh, we're kind of struggling. We've been getting by so far, but every day brings new challenges. Uh, let's end on a bright note. The bright note is, uh, again, the number of patients that we're seeing is decreasing. Um, here in Michigan, we have an incredibly strong governor and an incredibly obstinate legislature of a different uh, political party. We just really aren't listening to reason or reality. But uh, I think at least we're going to be able to make a difference and save some lives. It's, I'm just more worried about long term and how many more lives we're going to lose before this is all over. And uh, Mark, I think I've taken up more than my time, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. You know, you know what, uh, Kurt, if you don't mind, first of all, thank you so much, because uh, we've got some other uh, uh, speakers that we want to introduce. Um, if, if you can hang out with us and hold the Q&A to the end, that would be you great. Bet. I'll, I'll mute myself. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you, Kurt. That was, uh, that was really uh, helpful. And again, I've heard it uh, several times in it. It, our, our family spends a lot of time talking about it, uh, and obviously, uh, Kurt's become familiar with, with our product, and uh, as he said, uh, feels really good about uh, helping out and getting a conversation teed up at the right time uh, with the facilities management group at Beaumont, which will be great, and Kurt, I seriously will uh, get you in touch, as I said earlier, with uh, Jennifer, who runs our uh, Midwestern account sales. So. Uh, Moving over to uh, North Carolina, to uh, familiar grounds. Uh, many of you met our friend Arthur Blue at, at Sales Kickoff. What many of you might not know is that uh, after he gave that great talk about healthcare, uh, uh, from his perspective that got our attention, uh, we had a, a, a team dinner that lasted late. And, uh, and I have to apologize to Arthur before I bring him on because we had so much fun. He had me go through a history of Silicon Valley which I was hoping to take 10 minutes. It took about two hours, but we smoked some good cigars and I, and, and he would became my new best friend uh, until I found out from Chip the next morning that I actually dropped him off at the wrong Marriott. And he, you know, being a Marine, he was too much of a gentleman to tell me. So Arthur, I just wanted to thank you by I'm giving you this Cuban cigar as a, as an apology. So uh, hopefully you can see that. I wanted to give you that before I introduce you to give us a little bit of perspective, Kurt, uh, Arthur is on our advisory board, and uh, we chime in uh, to, to get his perspective and thought it would be important for him to you know, share his perspective on, uh, we haven't talked to him uh, in a while as a group, to talk about his observations uh, uh, and what he's seeing out in Duke and the many places he's been in Raleigh-Durham. So, Arthur, welcome. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Kurt, I really enjoyed that, giving it to us straight. And uh, my hat's off to the providers. You guys do a tremendous job, and uh, it makes what we do that much more poignant. And I appreciate you, and I certainly appreciate your candor. Now, for Mark, after that brief that Kurt just gave us about smokers in the South, you're trying to kill me now. Not only did you leave me at the wrong hotel, but you're now trying to kill me. But that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good thing so great so what we are experiencing here is, is uh, sort of similar uh, the, the pandemic hadn't quite hit us quite as bad as it has in the uh, northeast and on the west coast but uh, our numbers are increasing they, they, they've told us that we could expect our plateau to happen in June and so for us a plateau is, and this is gonna make Kurt say, wow, I wish for those, we're looking at 166 inpatient, COVID patients, you know, and uh, that's for a hospital with, uh, you know, a little under 600 beds. So, and those patients, of course, would be critical care patients, ICU patients and that. So, but just to echo that point, our capital budgets are strained 
to the end, almost non-existent. And I love this product. I love ARC, uh, what they've done at my previous hospital. Uh, we bought the product, installed it. The team did an outstanding job and it was making money for us. But the capital environment right now is pushed to the limit. There is no capital. Our hospital has projected to break, you know, break even. And then going forward, maybe a three and a half, four percent margin, you know, if we're if we're if we're able to eke that out. So uh, as far as a sales forecast of what ARC is doing, I'm thinking you're gonna to have to adjust your expectations going into the to the next, you know, quarters on your sales cycles. Your facility directors and facility uh, managers are just overwhelmed with maintaining a safe environment for the patients. Kurt, you could, uh, I don't know how many negative pressure rooms you guys have there at your hospital in Beaumont, but we've had to create these negative pressure rooms. That means you're, you're already trying to find scarce supplies, these negative air machines, you're spending capital, inflated costs to source these things if you can get them. You're paying 10 times, 15 times what they would be normally, but you have to have them to keep We're the doing staff. The same. And, and, and so that, that put a big hold in our capital requirements. I mean, you have to pay it. And, and, it, and the cost of our PPE, you know, you would usually pay 70 cents for N95 mask. And then you're paying, what, seven bucks if you can find them, up to 10 bucks, and you'll happily pay it. You know, so our, our, our capital resources have been strained quite a bit. And so what does that mean for ARC from where I sit? A product that under normal times actually creates efficiencies for me. Uh, most hospitals have aging infrastructure. The staff, you know, you have a knowledge drain when the, for the facilities team gets ready to retire. So the guy that was there 30 years, 40 years, he takes all that infrastructure knowledge with him when he leaves. But this product was able to help us capture that legacy information and, and move forward and be able to get more efficiencies out of our team. So I love the product. I love the way that it was delivered. I love the way that the team came in, captured our uh, drawings, uh, our historical documents, digitized that information, created an app for us to use so that our maintenance team can find a shutoff valve that hadn't been exercised in probably 20 years. But if it fails, we're going to have to shut down the east wing of the hospital, right? But that, those dollars are competing for payroll dollars are competing for provider dollars, are competing for being able to just keep the lights on. And where I salesperson, I'd maintain my relationships, talk about what we can do in the future, and just listen. Because that facilities director is gonna be challenged to make new purchases, particularly capital purchases going forward for the near future. Hey, Arthur, thank you so much. And, and I really appreciate the exchange you and I had earlier uh, yep. about that. I love the story about the truck and we can yep. talk about that later after, uh, after you, you're not going to smoke your cigar, but you're allowed to go have a cigar. <laughs> but, uh, but you've been a great friend of the company and I really, really appreciate the candid feedback. You know, one of the, the things that I failed to mention up front that as all my sales team who's on the phone knows is that, you know, I think every good sales organization uh, selling anything really needs to be in tune with the market. Where's it going? Because the tough part of this game, because we've never, we're not, you know, we're not seasoned COVID experienced people. So, so, you know, Marines are actually good people to talk to Arthur. So because you, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you people know how to be agile and, and make moves quickly, just like Dr. Wharton does in the operating room. Um, who, by the way, delivered my grandson as a, uh, a preemie and uh, so I made sure that uh, Parker, whose birthday's coming up, his fifth birthday, was properly cared for at Alta Bates. So our family uh, can't thank you enough, Dr. Wharton, for everything you did. Uh, but, uh, but what I loved about when I'm talking to people like Arthur and Dr. Wharton and others is, you know, when, if I ask you a question like, tell me, I know you love my product, but tell me where we stack up on initiatives because what I'm trying to prevent from happening is, is having my sales force potentially uh, have an expectation that transactions are gonna happen, say in the month of May or June, uh, obviously respecting the fact that you mentioned the 
capacity surge in the ER, the lack of revenue, elective surgery. But when Dr. Wharton sent me that note that I shared with Arthur about you know the bankruptcies they're talking about. I mean, it's it's a serious issue, and and I want us to get as educated as possible because if we need to pivot off our main vertical and and work on other verticals and let the space come back to us, that's kind of what we're talking. So thank you. So our next speaker. Um, is, uh, is somebody you haven't met, but he's been helping us in the background a ton. And uh, his name is George Eckert. And he, he, uh, he says he's retired, but I don't believe him. He uh, had a great, great uh, real estate career uh, at both uh, CBRE and Cushman Wakefield. And uh, Steve Mott and I know George very, very well. Uh, he, he makes the best gin fizzes at a tailgate that I can ever tell you about. But he's a dear, dear friend, and he's been he's been coaching us from behind the scenes because, like uh, like you just heard, he also, and I'll let him tell yourself, has some strong feelings about our our product. And George is kind of the secret godfather to our friend Riley, uh, who's helping us at CBRE, uh, who I invited on the call, but he's not available, and uh, is actually best friends and former Cal rugby teammates with. Bud Lyons, who I've mentioned several times, who is on the board of both Prologis and Equinix. So I, I wanted to tap George on the shoulder after he finished a round of golf in Palm Desert, which I'm really jealous about, George. Thanks a lot. Uh, but to really kind of share his views, what he's hearing about commercial real estate, industrial real estate, and, and what, uh, what his colleagues are, are telling him about positioning uh, yourself with what's going on. So George Eckert. Welcome to the cocktail party. Thank you, Beast. I, uh, I'm humbled by uh, following the people that I've been listening to, I'll tell you that. Um, and also, I'll echo your comments, because Dr. Wharton uh, delivered uh, both of my daughters. So um, <laughs> that's, uh, it's, it's a small world. Um, anyway, um, from the commercial real estate, perspective. I, I would just say that I'm on a team in San Francisco that has, um, we sell a, over a billion dollars a year in commercial real estate. We, do, we have nothing to do with, with hospitals, so I can't speak to that, but uh, mostly office buildings, industrial, uh, some retail. Um, I think that the number one uh, comment I would make today is the worst thing for real estate, you could probably say that about the stock market too, but the worst thing for real estate is uncertainty. And um, right now you've got tenants that don't know what their future is. You've got investors that don't know what they're, you know, what's going on. Is it a good time to invest or not? You've got lenders who say, geez, interest rates are at an all time low, but I'm too scared to lend. And, and so the market is, the market is basically uh, shut down. Uh, we, we, we've had a couple of listings, uh, 40, 60, $80 million deals, and we just advised our client, right now, if you came to the market, you'd be playing defense and not offense. So um, the, the market is, is pretty much shut down. Um, it'll be back. I mean, people say, when's it going to be back? Well, it's, it's obviously that we'd all agree. It's going to be back the day that they announce that there's an effective vaccine. The stock market's going to explode. The economy is going to come back very, very quickly. I think we all agree with that, and hopefully everybody will will survive to get to that point uh, economically. But um, but as relates to ARC, um, it, it's kind of the same thing that uh, Kurt and Arthur were talking about. Um, you know, it, it's it's not the right time uh, to be telling somebody to go out and invest. I think you can make a good argument. About about buying ARC for all the for all the right reasons, but it's going to be a tough um, you know uphill uphill climb right now to get somebody to to invest when you know hypothetically let's just say um, you know you had uh, a major tenant that just announced that they're going to lay off 40% of their people and you're not sure if they're even going to be paying rent next month. So. Um, that, that has nothing to do with the quality of the product. I mean, the properties that, that we pulled off the market in a normal time would sell very quickly and very easily at a, at a premium price. But right now, um, you know, they probably sell for 
80%, 60%, 70% of what they would sell for in a normal market. So I think, I think the bottom line, and I won't, I won't go uh, much longer on this, but I think ARC is a great product. It's been very well received by the people that I've talked to about it. Um, it makes sense. Um, but in this hopefully brief time of, of just total uncertainty, it's, it, it, it's a tough sell. So, uh, so what do you do? You know, you hunker down, you, you get ready for when the, you know, the, 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 the gun goes off and the race starts again and you get ready to hit it hard. But in the interim, you keep in touch with your clients, you keep in touch with your friends, you keep in touch with calls like this and, and you keep the pot, you know, stirred up so that when it's time to turn it on to boil, it's, it, it only takes, uh, you know, a brief period of time. So, I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, I just think the, you know, the bottom line is uncertainty is, is not your friend. Yeah, thank thank you, George, very much. So so uh, really appreciate that. And, and if uh, if Bud comes on, let me know because he had some ideas he wanted to share as well. But um, you know, this is it's always tough news. But you know, being an agile organization, uh, we're incredibly grateful for the news. But as as Arthur and I talked about this morning, and George, you just mentioned it uh, before I open it up for Q and A. You touched on so. Given that environment, what should we be doing? And Arthur said exactly what I hoped he'd say, and you just said it too, George, in a different way, is keep the relationships warm. Make sure that you're staying in tight communication. So when that door opens again, you're going to be you know, the first person that a buyer calls because, because being in tune with that, the relationship, the notion of connection. I, I saw something fascinating last night on an interview this uh, this doctor of psychology was actually talking about the high rate of suicide that's happening in uh, across our country, across the world. And the number one reason that they, they've traced to suicide is people that don't have the connection that they're used to, right? So it's, it's something that is, is really hard to synthesize, but, but in a business perspective, staying in touch with our clients and our friends who love our product and what we're doing, they're going to be our uh, eyes and ears and antennas. So, so with that, uh, for Kurt and Arthur and George, and maybe Ted, if he, if he finishes the 18th hole, George, we're going to let you tell us about that. Join us. <laughs> what I wanted to do is, is, is open up uh, to, to, to my sales organization. I've also invited other uh, executives from ARC just to have a, a conversation with these quote unquote friendlies about, you know, what they're seeing. And, and the common denominator of these friendlies is they're all huge, huge supporters of our company and want to help us in any way we can. So they can. So, so you're talking among friends. You just heard that. Uh, I owe them a lot. i I'm running out of cigars and good wine, George. I don't, I don't even know what I'm going to give you. I think I'm going to give you that joke. <laughs> yeah, George, I don't know if you were on the front end of the call. You weren't there, but I, I did. No. I, I brought you a bottle of Joe Cap wine, okay? And I know how much that I, you, right? <laughs> so, I've already got a couple, B. Send me a Cubano. Okay. And I don't know when Paul came on, but, Paul, I'm not sharing this with you. I'm, give, I'm going to run up to Surrey's house and drink it. It's a... It's a uh, Justin Zay Montrachet Premier Guru, 2011. You don't get that, Paul, until you give me some. Of your <laughs> but anyway, you drink all that is, uh, what I'd like the group to do is get comfortable at this quarantini party, and and you've got three fabulous people that uh, that that know a lot about their industries, and more importantly, how Arc facilities fits in their industries. You know, I'll, I'll tip you off on a little thing that we talked about earlier that George's uh, friend Bud. Uh, 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 shared with me that I shared with our marketing team, which is, okay, if, if the commercial real estate business is going to be incredibly tough for us, do we have a play in what we know is going to happen in terms of warehousing, given the Sino-American issues about supply chain, and what about what's our play in industrial, and, and do we have a play? And, and Dr. Wharton and I were talking yesterday, despite everything you're hearing, Dr. Wharton will probably tell you that in Detroit, it'll be one of the most thriving economies we've ever seen because we're going to be once again, Americans are going to be building American product and selling American product. And, and uh, that's what's going to happen. So with that, you know who I'm going to call on because uh, 
he had a tough day today, but he always has something to say. Um, I'm going to call on my friend uh, in New Jersey, Brian Mench, to tune in because I'm glad you uh, came back from uh, a fun day at the hospital. Brian, what's your question? Um, yeah, so um, it was a fun day at the hospital, and uh, I'm glad to be home. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know, my, my question is for George with regard to our solution and creating uh, efficiency and productivity. Is there a potential angle where our solution could be used as a competitive differentiator uh, for various facilities management and property management companies to help create uh, even more efficiency given the turbulent times ahead, making buildings more efficient. And I mean, do you see it as that being a, a potential use case that would attract folks? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I think definitely. When, when I first saw, I think the thing that ARC did, did very well was those, uh, whatever they call it, 60 seconds with ARC. When you, when you get on those, uh, they're on YouTube, I know, you get on, you look at them, and, you know, it walks you through a situation and a solution in 60 seconds, which is really good because nobody wants to watch a 30-minute, uh, you know, YouTube anymore. But right. – um, but I think you look at that and you say, wow, this makes sense. Um, I know the property management people that I talk to, particularly uh, Riley Wilhite, who is going to be on the call but couldn't make it, um, who runs a lot of major buildings for CBRE in San Francisco area. And, you know, you look at it and you say, wow, this, this, this just makes sense. It's, it's efficient. It's easy. Um, you know, you can probably um, – you know, spread, spread that around. If you don't, you don't need a property manager um, or a, or a building engineer to, um, you know, maybe you don't need one that's quite as uh, experienced. If you can just say, Hey, go to the third floor, turn to the right there, you know, there's, there's the, there's the switch kind of a thing. Um, I, I think it makes, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we've talked about, uh, again, I, I'll stand by my earlier comment that right now people may say, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, but I don't have a budget for it. Um, you also get back to the point where uh, a CBRE or a Cushman or Wakefield or a JLL that does property management, you know, th that is a really good, as we say, uh, you know, arrow uh, in your quiver, if you will, and you're going to go in and you're going to, you're going to pitch business. Property managers can all be fired uh, on a moment's notice. And, and um, uh, there, you know, there's, you might sign a, a, a one or two or three year contract, but you can be fired anytime you want. So you want to be, it's very competitive is why I said that. So if you go in and, and pitch the business with a tool like, like ARC and, and your competitors don't have it, uh, you got a much better chance of winning the business and, and keeping the business. <clears throat> and also, you know, being on the cutting edge of, of, of technology. So I think it's a great product. I mean, I, I don't think there's any, there's no one that would argue that it's not a valuable product. It's just a question of, you know, can I afford it and what's it worth to me? Yeah. Thanks, George. I appreciate it. Good talking to you again. Hey, yeah, Brian. So, so this is Arthur, Arthur Blue. So hey, Arthur. No, hey, great, great, great to see you again. So the, uh, the one industry in North Carolina, well, not one, but the industry in North Carolina that's growing like gangbusters that I've, that I've noticed are your Amazon warehouses. So I'm not sure on the property side if they are, you know, leasing those properties and building them, but the warehousing uh, uh, segment, I'm, I'm, they, I know they have facility types, maintenance types, and they probably have right. a crew that goes from building to building. So anything that, that adds efficiency that way is worth exploring, you know, so. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that would be, uh, you know, the same benefits that, that I would receive, they would receive perhaps to a lesser degree where houses aren't really that complicated, but still the people that travel around to maintain them, it gives them an efficiency to be able to pull up the blueprints or pull up the drawings 
and see where they're going to go to address a complaint, you know? Yeah. Arthur, th Arthur this is George. I, I would agree with that. I mean, I've, I've sold uh, 2 million plus square foot Amazon deals and I've sold a 600,000 foot um, FedEx distribution warehouse. And I would say if any of you ever have a chance to actually go in one of those, it's just mind boggling how those things are run with, with all, you know, all the efficiencies they have. You, you, you know why Amazon is good is, is makes as much money as they do when you just walk into one of those buildings. But it is a, like, let's call it a 1 million square foot building with, with basically only four walls. So yep. at one point you can say, well, how do I turn the water off? Well, I see that about, see that about 50 yards down there in the right, that big red handle, you turn that. Uh, you know, so it's a little bit more complicated in a hospital or in a multi-tenant office building. But that said, if you're the owner of, you know, five Amazon buildings, or if you are Amazon and you've got an on-site manager that's responsible for, say, three or four buildings, it's definitely, uh, you know, definitely a value add to have the, to have the, um, you know, the ARC platform. Although I, I would say it's way more valuable, um, I would suspect, in a hospital or in a multi-tenant office building that, you know, has multiple floors and, you know, multiple uh, various systems that you need to access. But it's yeah. still, it's still, it's still, it's still, it's still good. And, and, but I would say industrial, probably not as much as hospital and office. Yeah, I, I concur. Just thinking of other channels. And one thing yeah. that I didn't mention was, uh, so at our hospital, UNC Rex there, uh, during the, uh, the, uh, at the onset of this, uh, you know, pandemic, we had a need, like most hospitals, you're thinking about how am I going to direct all these patients at our ED? How am I going, how am I going to get people from where they are to where I need them to be? We established, you know, a good relationship with the reprographic portion of, of ARC you know, of your, uh, of your company. And those folks came in and helped us out a lot. So that was a relationship that just spoke volumes and quality, you know, to me. And so when I'm talking with the CFO and talking about goodwill toward the organization, I relate back that, you know, we needed signs, you know, in a hurry to help move some of the masses through our system. And ARC came through for us. And I mean, they gave us a real competitive price. They even donated some stuff. So that, so, so preserving those relationships and telling a good story, that comes back when the, when the funding comes back to healthcare. So look for ways to build and capitalize on those relationships. Hello. Okay, next uh, question. Good question, Brian. Let's, uh, let's go out to our uh, friendly surfer, Nick Roth on the West Coast. Uh, who, uh, who's actually done a really good job refocusing his energy on uh, both college and K through 12. And one of the things, uh, Kurt and uh, Arthur and George, we found is, you know, there's some, believe it or not, some bond money, despite what you read about. But Nick, uh, any questions you have from our, uh, our panel? Um, yeah, I mean... Uh... Obviously, we got to be thinking outside the box with with these organizations and in uh, this time and what I've found in uh, some of the education systems. And you know, I'd be interested to hear from the panel just your, your thoughts or if you've heard anything, um, you, you know, with any of the university campuses or K through 12 systems. And I'm not sure if you um, work closely with any of those, but yeah, they they uh, are still kind of carrying on with their projects. Um, modernization projects and renovation projects and they have uh, what some have communicated to me is bond money that's still available and as well as they can articulate to um, th their powers to be why, why ARC would fit into um, you know with a description on how ARC would support those initiatives they have and they're utilizing that bond money effectively you know with a purpose um, I've had some positive feedback. So, you know, if, uh, any thoughts from you guys or um, are you aware of any of these programs out there that, you know, although we're in this pandemic and economic crisis, there still is available funds out there for 
supporting infrastructure and um, you know some of these schools especially being that you know their class is not in session physically and it's giving these folks the opportunity folks being uh, these facility directors the ability to put some focus in on projects and, and better prepare and equip their their schools so when they're back in session uh, they're even more efficient than they were uh, prior, you know, pre-COVID. Okay, thank you, Nick. I don't know if Arthur or Kurt or uh, George want to respond to that, but uh, kind of a status that we are chasing up that uh, the, those those uh, verticals. So uh, I'll let you guys jump in and respond, and then again, open it up to the floor so I don't have to call on anybody. Again, these uh, these good friends of ARC are are here uh, and and ready to take any questions or or, or whatever you want to talk about. This is Chip. Hey, Chip. Hey, I've uh, got a question for George. Um, you know, given kind of the change of within property management, and you know, we don't know what this is going to look like from a, a real estate empty space, you know, more people working from home, but my mind goes to data centers. Have you had any experience in working, I mean, this is perfectly similar to a warehouse, except you're housing technology and a lot of infrastructure, but where, where do you see data centers playing into uh, what we offer? And maybe, that I think there could be an increased interest uh, because these, I don't think they're slowing down and building them but I certainly wanted to hear your, your take on that. Yeah. Well, Chip, let me just start by, let, let, let me start by saying that I don't um, have a lot of direct familiarity uh, personally with selling or, or operating data centers. I mean, uh, uh, Bud Lyons would have been good on here because he's uh, on the board of Equinix, uh, which is a big data storage center. But uh, I would say that obviously uh, you're kind of part of your question um, leads into what the future holds. I, th I think um, a lot of companies, our company, Cushman and Wakefield now, is talking about how we're going to reopen. And, you know, with, with I don't think the, uh, the social distancing is going to go away, which means that, you know, two years ago, everything was open space, bullpen, kind of a, kind of a situation in our offices. And now, like in our office, it's hugely bullpen, but the only people that make sense to come in are the guys with private offices. Um, and, and so there's going to be a lot more, you know, uh, Zoom, Zoom calling. There's good, like what we're doing here. There's going to be a lot more investment committees on, on whatever you want to call it, Zoom or, or Microsoft or whatever. Um, a lot more working uh, from home. Uh, which has an impact on office centers, uh, office buildings, but it also has a big impact on data centers. Most data centers uh, are owned by funds, whether it's a, a data center REIT or a, a portfolio that's owned by an investor. And when you own a number of them, um, it's just, and they're not, they're not all cookie cutters. I mean, they all have specific locational requirements, but they're probably not all 50,000 foot rectangular buildings sitting in a business park. Uh, so I think having, you know, ARC so that if you do have a situation in your building, you can absolutely cut response time to a, to a minimum. I mean, needless to say, a data center goes down and you're screwed. So if you've got an issue with, you know, electricity, uh, any of your utilities, uh, anything like that that you need to get to quickly and you own, let's say, hypothetically 10 data centers, or maybe if you're a big boy, you own a thousand data centers, um, you know, having something like ARC that you can, what, within a minute, uh, find out whatever you're looking for in, in a build, any one of the buildings you own, I think it would be, it would be uh, an extremely valuable. I mean, the cost of ARC would disappear if if it would save you you know an hour of downtime in a data center i mean that's, so that's, I, I i hey george one of the yeah that prompted another question sorry to interrupt uh one of the things that we struggle with and i've talked to all three of you about personally is 
you know, the, the real toughest part is everybody's in sales, whether they know it or not, is how do you take the value proposition to the C-level executive so that they will listen to you? And, you know, having been the CEO before of a facilities management software company, when I met Surrey, that's the first thing we talked about. I go, well, obviously, nothing's really changed in 15 years. Because as you well know, George, especially, and Arthur, especially, in your worlds is, you know, it, the, the conversation has typically been, you know, with the facilities manage, manager and then trying to get that partnership built like Steve Mott's old world and then go up to meet with a senior level executive. What, one thing I've noticed in the, and, and you guys are all good examples, uh, is the access that I've had to C-level executives is easier now than it's ever been because people are, you know, they're sequestered like we are, but if you've got a, a valuable thought leadership idea, you know, it, they seem to be available. So can you, can you touch on that? Um, I'm going to call on you, Arthur, first, because I, I'm guessing that we have a rare opportunity to have our conversation uh, that we've always wanted to have with executives in a very meaningful way during the sequester that we wouldn't normally have. Uh, yeah, good, good question. So the style that uh, has always worked, and I, I may have alluded to it when I was fortunate enough to visit you guys, is turn that facilities point of contact or that real estate point of contact into an advocate. Get them to be, you know, to build that relationship. Some of these, some of these team members you may have to coach up, get them to be advocate for your product. Show them how it's going to make a difference in that facility. What are you going to do for that organization? What problem, what challenge is your product going to fix or repair or make easier? And then work on the value proposition, uh, you know, through a relationship. Case studies. Get a great narrative. That way, when that facility director is able to get in front of the C, that, that C executive, then he's bringing the team salesman with him. And so tell, tell the, the executive how you're going to make the organization better. What are you going to do? What problem are you going to solve? Oh, so, so in, in addition to the messaging, Arthur, do you feel that we'll have a better shot of being able to get that executive uh, into a, you know, a half hour conversation? Oh, I, I think so now. So healthcare, so everybody's stressed right now. Right. So, if you, you know, with healthcare, but they do have time because everybody's sequestered. Most of the administrative staff is either working from home or whatnot. So you should have an opportunity to get in there. But again, time being the most valuable asset, talk to them about what you're going to solve, how you're going to make a difference. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, uh, back out to the field. Jennifer, your turn. We got you a, we got you a new prospect for you. Yeah, thank you. Nice to, nice to meet you, Kurt. Um, so my question is around part of the facilities management arm. Um, that we don't normally um, go after. And hey, Dave Trask, you need to go on mute. Sorry to call you out. But, um, you know, I'm looking at our product and, and what's really, um, you know, got a lot of focus these days when it comes to cleaning environments is a custodial or environmental health services staff. And, you know, the, the, Based of what I understand about how scheduling works for janitorial custodial is it's based on square footage and understanding how much square footage um, based on cleanliness standards somebody can cover during a shift. Do you, do you feel it's worthwhile for us to kind of tailor our, our message and how we look at our product to serve that custodial space and knowing square footage and how fixtures come to play in how much time it's going to take the team to clean an area? Or do you feel that there's enough tools out there that are already in place that give them those answers? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, so any thoughts? On so on your on your environmental services side, 
they, they do look at square footage. So I don't know if we're capturing the detail of soap dispensers, lights, doors, or fixtures in the sense of how that's going to impact cleaning. But what it can help with is an orientation of the facility. It can help with how they plan their cleaning routes because you're looking at a diagram you, and you can uh, get some square footages on that. So if you look at coworker A that has the responsibility of, you know, pack you and some other area like that, well then you can give that coworker a map and show them exactly where they, you know, what their area of responsibility is. And then I guess you could do some leveling or balancing based on square footage and complexity for the uh, environmental team. So it's a good way to start a conversation. I wouldn't walk away from it. I would sell it as a benefit. Great, okay. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking it would go in, yeah, I was thinking it would kind of go in line with looking at like say buildings and being able to mark up and say, okay, you used to clean this zone, now, you know, marketing it off and showing it's you know, a different zone, but thank you. Yeah, so switching gears, um, you've heard from my uh, regional sales managers. Uh, as, as you all know, we also have a group of very talented uh, inside salespeople that I always say have the toughest job in the company, which is to land a conversation and schedule a WebEx you know, um, uh, meeting. So, so I don't know if Bob, met you or members of your team have some questions on approach. And then the other group that, that I want to hear from is is something that I think a lot about, uh, and, it, and it used to be a real big advantage, uh, as George and Arthur know, which is our unbelievably talented uh, installation team that does most of their magic on site, and they've been working very hard under Todd Moore's leadership on how, and, and Riley is, is a great example, George, of how do you how do you get that uh, data collected so that we can get started? So uh, maybe some questions from first Bob, you and your group on, on, on approach, and then Todd, maybe some questions from your group on uh, how, do we, how do we get that message across uh, when usually our, uh, we, our star shines brightest when we're on site and we can't go on site. So Bob? Yeah, thanks Mark, and, and thanks guys for giving up your time to help us out today. It's, it's, uh, Greatly appreciated, but uh, the, the question I, I guess I have is, you know, over the last three months with everything that we're going through and people transitioning uh, within verticals and organizations, uh, we, we've learned a little bit more about the healthcare vertical in terms of the air filtration systems and filtering clean air, but regardless of vertical, over the last three months, has anything really come to the forefront of from a facility perspective that you really haven't had to think about before, but now it's become more of a priority because of what we're going through. And, and, and if so, can you touch on, touch on that? Um, hey, Bob, this is, this is George. I, I, I mean, I can't answer that specifically, but I'll answer it generally speaking. And it's an old, old um, phrase that I learned years ago in the business is, it's really hard to control your revenue, but if you can't control your expenses, you shouldn't be in business. And, and I think that's one approach with, with, with ARC is it's a means to help get a handle on some of your, some of your expenses, particularly the, the, uh, you know, the surprise ones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly, at least in the short run, it's not going to help you um, bring in new tenants or raise your rent, but it, it will give you a, a, a good, efficient way to manage. And, um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful tool uh, to help, you know, either on-site or portfolio property managers. So, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's a perspective I have on, on it. And it's not that expensive, especially related to what the potential benefit could be. Yeah, I, I would echo that same sentiment, George. Uh, I mean, in normal times, you know, this isn't even a budget dust cost, you know. Right. And, and the challenge is that, you know, we're, of course, we're not in normal times right now. So, we, you know, how do you position to, to do what you can when, when, in times like these? So selling that value, 
building on the relationship and just communication, communication, communication. Yeah, that's great. Good question, Bob. Anybody else uh, in Denver? Uh, Kara, Chad, Matt, you get, you get, you got some, you got some good friends on the phone. Any questions about approach on, on the inside sales side? Yeah, it's Chad out here in Denver. Um, and yeah, thanks guys for taking the time. Um, yeah, you know, so, you know, Mark's right. We do have the hardest job. I'm going to take him up on that. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to maybe call somebody in your position. Um, you might not know ARC. You might have interacted with our product through some sort of, um, you know, webcast or something like that. But given the current climate and how, you know, as you said, it's going to be difficult to, to get things done, you know, now, but there is a, an end in sight. What, what, are, what do you want to hear from somebody who is reaching out to you um, with an interesting proposition um, and that they've laid out for you for a reason why you should take the meeting. Um, should we have more of a, a, a consultative approach and be more laid back, um, you know, just wanting to introduce ourselves and our product and then asking, you know, time to, to follow up? Um, you, you know, I hope that's not the answer because I still have a monthly quota, but, you know, I do want to be respectful and do what's right for the business and not just for me. Um, and, and I feel at times now that those those are those are uh, are are not mutually exclusive necessarily. But I guess the, the meat of my question is, what do you want to hear from a representative that that's calling you? Um, you? You know, do you want to hear empathy, and you want, or is there still a respect to to get in and 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 take a more optimistic approach of how you said things are going to open, the stock market is going to rebound, business is going to get back to usual. This is just going to be a blimp in you know ten years. Um, you know how do we as as development reps on that first call unpack all of that to get your best attention for ultimately winning you as business? Chad, this is George. I'll 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 answer that and let let the other guys chime in as well. But I mean, I would say right now. Any one of your quote unquote buyers has got a plenty of stuff on his on his table right now. I mean, they're stressed out. They don't know what's going on with their tenants. Um, you know, they don't know what's going on personally. Uh, they're laying people off, et cetera. The last thing that they're going to respond positive, positively to is a hard sell. And I don't care what you're selling unless you're selling toilet paper. Um, but, but, um, so I, I, you know, I would use this time uh, to, to show some, you know, target, target your tenants, reach out to them, show them empathy, show them understanding, at least get them to spend a little bit of time. I mean, the, I, I really think those, those 60 seconds with ARC are really good. And I would, I would create one. I haven't seen one like this, but I would create one that says, you know, you, you got the thing where the guy, the, the salesman walks into the office and the guy says, well, I've hired you. Now, how the hell am I going to do all this with all these plans and all this? And the salesman says, just relax. You don't have to do any of this. I'll take care of it for you. You know, um, so so I would I would just start, you know, laying one brick at a time right now because the hard sell is going to be like, are you kidding me? This doesn't this guy know what's going on in my life and my business? You know, I don't have time for this. So, I, I mean, I would, it's not what you want to hear with a quota, but, you know, it's, I think that's the reality of the world right now. And I, it's not just what you're doing, it's anything. Yeah, George, I, I love that response uh, because I always remind everybody on my staff that we're all consumers. We all buy something from somebody and usually we buy things from, people that we trust and who we like. So, so yeah. So if you, you know, we talked a lot about that at kickoff and Chad, that was a great question by the way, because you know, if you, if you get somebody's time like George or Kurt or Arthur, you better darn well understand something about what probably going through their minds. So that's a great reminder. Okay. I'm going to be respectful of time because you know, we're only going to go for another nine minutes at, 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 we're not going to have a after party that George usually goes to at the Bohemian Club. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to those, and then we get into some things that we're not allowed to say on Zoom. But but uh, let's go over to uh, Todd to your group, the uh, implementation group. Uh, perhaps some questions of uh, George, Kurt, and Arthur. 
<clears throat> yeah, sure. Uh, so good afternoon, good evening. Very, very informative talk. Uh, uh, enjoying it quite a bit. I've, I've got a little bit, uh, you know, different flavor of a question. Um, so, you know, as the implementation team, as the customer success team, you know, we've got, oh my word, we, we've got so many customers that we need to get out on site to see. Um, so, you know, the, the salespeople have worked their magic. We have the clients that signed the deals and now the clients are saying to us, okay, so when can you come on site? Um, we've got the likes of, of Fenway Park saying, you know, gee guys, now would be an excellent time to come out. You know, we don't have anybody in the ballpark. We've, we've got two folks here that are, that are ready and willing to walk you around and, and show you all of the assets and all of the equipment that you've got. Um, you know, we've got school districts saying, man, now's a good time. No students are here. You know, we've got, we've got access to people to, uh, you know, to, uh, to walk you around. So I guess my question is, is, you know, really aimed to, uh, to Kurt, um, what, what precautions or, or what, what safety concerns might you have about the first trip that we take? And if we're going on site, you know, what, what type of safety gear would you, uh, would you consider? Good question. Um, certainly we treat everybody as infected until proven otherwise. And, but more importantly, when we bring people on site, we're worried about their personal safety. One of the reasons we've restricted access to the hospitals, either no visitors at all or one visitor at most, is number one, we don't want people bringing disease into the hospital. So we don't want innocent people coming in being victimized by being exposed to the disease. If you want to find the nastiest bugs on the planet, you visit a hospital. That's where we grow the best bacteria and viruses. <laughs> so certainly, if you were to come in, yeah, it'd be great. And we'd slap an N95 mask on you and make sure your sleeves are covered up and put some gloves on you that, you know, we'd encourage you not to touch anything. But, you know, as soon as you're done, you know, you take your gloves off and you know, dispose of your mask. You get home, you shed your clothes, go right into the shower and make sure your clothes go into the washer and dryer. Uh, it's a hazardous environment. Gotcha. Un understood. What, what about plane travel? Because, because again, we, the four of us are scattered across the United States. Uh, what's your feeling on uh, hopping on an airplane? Avoid it if all possible. Uh, many of the airlines are now requiring that you wear a mask, uh, but you're putting yourself, you know, really at risk. You know, everybody talks about the six foot isolation, but we know from more sophisticated studies that somebody coughs, sneezes, spits, talks loudly, that those spitules, we call them fomites, the water that comes out of your mouth and your nose that has the virus, that goes 13, 20 feet. You get in an airplane, everything is plastic. And we know that this virus lives on plastic and metal, even cardboard, for more than three to four days. You get in an airplane, you know, the person who's coughing in, in the yeah. front row of the first class, you know, that area gets circulated back to the person sitting in the last row next to the head. So you really want to avoid all the travel that you can. Yeah, one and, and sorry to jump in, guys. Uh, you guys, some of you may have seen what they already got started on with some of the European carriers, which is a complete reconfiguration of the airplane to put plastic shields uh, between you and the people next to you, and then flipping the middle seat so it goes the other way. So this whole notion of tight communication, you know, I, I heard, uh, you know, uh, Barry Diller, the CEO of Expedia, trying to, explain that nothing's wrong and get, get on the airplanes and fill the middle seats. But you know, that that's going to change. And then as George knows, and, and Dean who's on our marketing team been talking about, you know, what about the configuration of an entry to any building or hospital or university with, with the notion of having to go through an infrared screen that we're, people are already sourcing out of South Korea that uh, actually is not that sophisticated. All it does is detect your temperature and uh, blood pressure and somebody will make a determination that you're not going into the building. So, so there's gonna be you know, a couple of levels of kind of prehistoric technology going all the way up through you know, really, really heavy thing. You've seen some of the drone testing, et cetera, but that, that's uh, really interesting to look at. So uh, jumping around, I, um, uh, I know this, uh, this is not the first time you've met John Sterling because all three of you have seen John Sterling do demos for you. So John's been chomping at the bit to ask about 13 questions. And I told him to go ride his motorcycle around the block and come back. So John, you, you uh, get to ask one really good question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, 
yeah, my uh, my lap around the block is over. I actually have. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna describe it as a two part question then because Mark is only allowing me one. So, um, Pert and Arthur, you guys described some some really kind of challenging times for uh, for hospitals, and and I appreciate the candor and I appreciate your time very greatly that you're, that you're giving us today. And I am curious, what do you feel like a, a recovery looks like for from a hospital standpoint? Obviously, I'm not asking when. I, you know, I don't think we can predict that, but. When that happens, what do you feel like the priorities will be for the hospital? Do you think it will be a fast recovery, a slow one? Um, and, and related to that, I think certainly, Arthur, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on a compliance uh, documentation module. And I'm curious if you see any changes related to compliance coming and uh, just your thoughts on, on that whole situation as well. Arthur, you want to go first? Okay, great. Thank you. That was a good question. So let's take the uh, the uh, the uh, the latter first. So on the compliance. So for us, we were in the joint commission window, and so the joint commission has pushed back, you know, their triennial inspection schedule. So you know they 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 are trying to figure it out as well. Now compliance don't doesn't go away. However, comma I will say that compliance will probably look a little different. But saying that the game for meeting the uh, rules for participation, you know, as the Joint Commission inspect us on and those other uh, agencies will become more and more important just because of how the, how you make money in healthcare or how you get paid. You know, you have to be able to participate with Medicaid and Medicare to halfway keep the, uh, the lights on. So that compliance tool that I'm familiar with, my group is still talking about it. It's, it's still, present in the discussion, particularly when I'm with the uh, compliance folks. So I would say keep selling it. It's going to come back. But remember, right now, we're trying to keep the lights on, trying not to fire everybody and still trying to treat some sick as hell patients, you know. So so just it, it's coming. I, I would, you know, if you're talking to facilities directors in healthcare, you know, continue to sell that point, have them carry that mail for you and their relationships with the students. So, so yeah, that's, that is still a good point. Good question. So what does a recovery look like? And from my point, I think when we start doing more elective surgeries, that's going to help a lot when they open that up in the healthcare and perhaps, you know, it may look a little different. Some of your ambulatory surgery centers will crank up first. So working with the hospital real estate group, will become another avenue. So I'm thinking, you know, third or fourth quarter, maybe. Yeah, this is Kurt. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Mark Beesman to have a few more elective back surgeries. I can't ask <laughs> him to have any more babies, but, you know, that's where we make our money. Um, I mean, even in the good times, um, it's always a struggle because I mentioned before, the medical industry operates on a razor thin margin that no one else would tolerate. Uh, we have a constant battle to get things that we need. We, our capital budget, I need to buy a new laser. I need a robot for the operating room. I need to replace operating room tables. I had a $4 million remodel project uh, that I'd scaled down from 20 million. Um, that I was told, you know, three months ago, no problem. It's in the budget. We're going to get this done. I'm never going to see that. Um, we have people doubling up, tripling up, quadrupling up on jobs and responsibilities, which you can do briefly. And again, I'll reemphasize that there's an extremely strong possibility this is not just going to go away quickly. It's going to come back and kick us in the face again uh, this fall, next winter. Uh, pray to God it doesn't come back a third time. So the hospitals aren't going to be spending money on anything. I want to emphasize what you're saying before, maintain your relationships, uh, look for those that you can partner with. Um, but it's just, you're going to be trying to get water out of stone for a while, trying to get new contracts. John, are you good with that or do you need it? Do you yeah. want you need to? Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, John, uh, Thank you. you've done Thank a great you. job demoing to everybody and, and uh, it really is a beautiful product as these people know. Okay, rounding the horn. Um, I think we've called on a lot of people, but b believe it or not, I usually 
call on Suri for the last word, but, but he's my next question. And then I'm going to a surprise last word. So Suri, you're up. <laughs> hey, Mark. <laughs> Sorry hey. about that. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, uh, both Kurt and Arthur, thank you so much. It's uh, It's been very interesting uh, listening, but I actually had to, um, you know, my calls were overlapping with another couple of calls, Mark, so I've been switching on and switching off, but uh, certainly uh, enjoyed the discussion, appreciate the feedback, and obviously there is a lot of good stuff uh, we have in front of us, and we just have to understand the ground game clearly and then execute and which of course is your specialty mark i'll so turn it back to you okay and and george your uh, your decorated godson riley and and suri really went at it together in a good way uh riley asked some really good questions and and suri got very very detailed so uh one thing we really really try to work hard on is i think george you brought it up uh was how do we get the value proposition tightened up so we, we make that precious conversation work every time. Okay, so before we end, uh, as many of you know, um, Steve Krupp's anniversary and my birthday are on the same day. Uh, we did not know that until two days ago. But Steve Krupp called me and he said, hey, it's my anniversary. I said, well, it's my birthday. I said, what should we do? I said, you should get an order and call me back. So. For my birthday present, our last speaker, Steve Krupp, uh, who's located in Tampa, who took me to one of the greatest restaurants I've ever been in. You can talk about it if he wants, but uh, Steve, you, uh, you, uh, by virtue of the fact that I think you brought in the only big order, but it was a great order from Ocala, uh, ending on a good note, um, to kind of remind all of us that despite everything you've heard, uh, and 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 you know, people used to tell me that. Facts are friendly, even if it's bad news. Um, you actually had some good news, so I'm going to give you the last word. You can brag, you can cajole, you can show pictures of your granddaughters, or you can ask a question. But you get the final word, Steve Krupp. Oh, thanks, Mark. Listen, guys, <laughs> thanks so much again for your time today. It's uh, very, very informative. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I was very fortunate to uh, – to uh, get a deal done with uh, Advent Health Ocala. Um, I started that relationship three years ago. Uh, at the time, that hospital was under a different banner, uh, different ownership. Um, Advent Health took them over a year ago. Uh, when that acquisition took place, then I had to wait uh, for about a year as their systems had to be updated to Advent Health standards. Um, I was fortunate that right before uh, everything broke loose here with COVID that uh, the director wanted to move forward and uh, had a great meeting with the CFO, got the green light. We got put into the, uh, put into the queue for the budget and um, they, uh, they pulled the trigger on it this week. So timing's everything in life. And I guess we, we, we were good timing on there. So that was, uh, that was a good thing. And yes, it, uh, it was a great week, right, Mark? Happy birthday. And uh, I'm 36 years uh, being married. So um, I got a few more to go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Um, really, I do have just one. Yeah, just just one question, real quick, uh, and this really goes to uh, to uh, author. So, um, you know, I, I try to understand uh, and try to empathize with uh, a lot of the facility directors that I meet up with every day. I spend a lot of time with hospitals specifically. Um, my my question really is is from you know from an operations standpoint, is there any clarity yet starting to form on, you know, post COVID on things, on major things that you think you're going to have to adjust in your department, um, you know, supporting your, supporting your building. So, you know, for example, do you think your uh, staff, you're going to have to, uh, to reduce staff, uh, you know, ultimately, or, or are there any other areas that you're now looking at and considering are going to be different post COVID? So, so the answer to that is, is unsettled at this time, and that's a great question. You know, for our health system, UNC Health there, so at my hospital, our budget forecast for the end of the year is break even or maybe a 1% margin. You know, we haven't had to do any layoffs or anything else like that. But I, I'll tell you, the business climate has changed. I mean, I, I shared, you know, the story about I got a 20-year-old pickup truck that we use to service some of our outbuildings. And I, you know, it's rusted out. 
I couldn't even get approval, you know, out of my operations budget to even get a lease. So that's just how tight, you know, new projects are right now. And so that's not always going to be the case, but it would be just a guess to tell you when we're going to loosen those, uh, loosen those capital string, uh, you know, so, and not all health systems are in, in, in that, are in that prediction. So just keep your relationships, uh, develop a relationship with the gatekeepers. They can usually give uh, the, the uh, product team uh, an idea on what's pressing for the decision makers and uh, just keep at it. I will always shoot straight with Chip or whoever, the, you know, I call him my guy for art and, uh, and, and, and do what we can. I mean, I really believe in your product. It sells itself for me as far as I'm concerned. And that's speaking from someone who's purchased it and had it installed. So just maintain those relationships. It will get better. Okay. Great question, Steve. And uh, before we wrap and thank you, I want to, um, my great aunt used to, uh, on her birthday, used to give her nephews and nieces uh, a present. And uh, we used to get, when we were young kids, a crisp $5 bill, which at the time was a lot of money. And I said, well, that's such a great idea. I'm going to give you all a gift because it was my birthday. And two things. So, Arthur, I don't know if you ever heard this, but a good friend of mine who was a Marine said that Marines are taught to be able to overcome any obstacle which serves them well in chaos of combat. This concept is encapsulated in the Marine slogan, and I quote, improvise, adapt, and overcome which is the mindset that allows Marines to deal with any physical, mental, or spiritual hardship. Okay? So I bet you, Arthur, you've heard that before, right? Yeah, you're making me blush. Okay, I can see, I can see you blushing. Don't go smoke the cigar. But here's my final gift to you, because I love stuff like this, and George will not be surprised. So um, um, many of you have heard me like uh, reference uh, people and famous quotes, but um, I got this article that I want to read to you, and I was hoping Tracy could join us, our esteemed uh, corporate counsel, because she's from Montreal, and this is about Canadians. And, and the, the title of the article that was written back in 2014, which somebody reminded me was a great article, it says, Why Business People Won't Stop Using That Gretzky Quote, Okay. So obviously the quote is uh, every everyone wants to be like Gretzky and skate to where the puck is going. Good luck with that. So uh, bear with me. It says in the annals of overused corporate cliches, few match the immortal words of Walter Gretzky as passed on to the world through his son Wayne. Quote, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. The Gretzky puck quote has been used, rehearsed, and mangled by CEOs, managers, corporate consultants, and MBAs for years. It's launched 100 million PowerPoint presentations, and it keeps going strong. In debuting its new Passport phone on Wednesday, this will remind you it was really 2014, BlackBerry took things up a notch by actually having Gretzky there to launch and recite it, even though he bungled it at first, saying, as my dad always said, go to where the puck is before correcting himself. To get a sense of its rising popularity, this trend chart from Infomark, the new database, illustrates the increase in the number of stories in which the phrase, where the puck and the word company appear. So here is just a small sample of some of the quotes, more prominent appearances in business. Steve Jobs, quote, there's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be not to where it has been. And we've always tried to do that at Apple. You can listen to him say it here, da, da, da. Warren Buffett on stock market pessimists like George Eckert in 2008. Well, in waiting for the comfort of good news, they are ignoring Wayne Gretzky's advice. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. John <laughs> Roth, former CEO of Nortel in 2001. Quote, so we're looking at this and saying, when the customers have money again, when will that be and which products do we have? Make, making sure we go to where the puck is going to be. 
and so on and so forth. So, so the thing I leave you with is, you know, whatever, you know, quote you're going to use before you meet uh, George Eckerd or Kurt Wharton or Arthur Blue uh, during the sequester, make sure you understand what you're talking about. And with that, I cannot thank you enough. My uh, three amigos from, uh, from all sorts of uh, places in, in the industry. And uh, it's incredibly helpful what you've shared with us. Great questions, everybody. So, so Paul, here is uh, the glass of wine you want. Everybody have a great weekend. Cheers. Thank you, Beast. Take care. Cheers, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.